Be wary of an expert opinion and your own. When faced with something new, experts always bring their particular way of looking at things. Whatever does not fit into their frame of reference is dismissed, not seen, or forced to fit into their beliefs. Thus, really new ideas seldom arise from the experts in the field. If an expert says something can be done, he's probably correct. But if he says it is impossible, then consider getting another opinion. Do not act as an expert. Ask yourself regularly, what would I accept as evidence that I am wrong? Why do I believe whatever I do? Especially in the areas where you are so sure you know the area of the paradigms of your field. The key to a good joke is misdirection. And the most effective misdirection is self-imposed. The ways we naturally think about the subject of the joke are precisely the causes of our capacity to be fooled. The first principle is that you must not fool yourself. And you are the easiest person to fool. Love what you do, pursue your interests. The most important ingredient for a successful career is finding a topic that excites you. Digging into answer interesting and important questions and having a real passion for science. Doing science means playing the long game. And you cannot persevere on this path if you dislike the work you do every day. This is especially true if you're not driven or even worse, if you're bored by the problems you work on. Choose the topic that you have a burning desire to know more about. In order to do that, you need to reflect on what your true motives and inclinations are. If I could tell students anything, it would be to take the time to discover who it is that you are and then to be true to what that person is, you know, what your interests are, what your values are. And this may be not be what your family tells you or your friends or the society at large. So for me it was, you know, my love of math and science, but it could well be something else for you. And at the end of the day, I think it's just worth it to make that journey of self-discovery because you have to live with yourself. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. You get what you measure. There is this famous story by Eddington about some people who went fishing in the sea with a net. Upon examining the size of the fish they had caught, they decided there was a minimum size to the fish in the sea. That conclusion arose from the tool used and not from reality. The way you choose to measure things controls to a large extent what happens. This is seldom thought about by people setting up a rating, measuring, or other schemes of recording things. And yet in the long run, it has enormous effects on the entire system usually in directions in which they never thought about at all. Accuracy of measurement tends to get confused with the relevance of measurement. Much more than most people believe that a measurement is accurate, reproducible, and easy to make does not mean it should be done. Instead, a much poorer one, which is more closely related to your goals, may be much preferable. For example, in school, it is easy to measure training and hard to measure education. And hence, you tend to see on final exams an emphasis on the training part and a great neglect on the education part. How then do you decide which scale to use in measuring things? There's no easy answer. Indeed. While one scale of measurement is suitable for one kind of conclusion in a field, another scale of measurement may be more appropriate for some other kind of decision in exactly the same 
field. But how seldom is this recognized and used? People are more important than papers. Reach out to people who are doing similar things. Working with others, collaborators in or outside of the lab will teach you skills you did not have and new ways of thinking about a problem. Seek out your neighboring labs, even those focused on unrelated problems. You might think of a new connection between fields. Do not skip social events. We all have heard how some of the best ideas in science came together at a bar or a dinner. There are more ways to socialize in science. You can organize an event, help to find sponsors, get involved with committees, give career advice to students and younger colleagues, become a mentor. By trying these things, you develop a network of contacts that will greatly expand your options for the future. And you'll learn a lot about yourself. Every scientist needs to be exposed to feedback and criticism from colleagues in the scientific community in order to grow. Sometimes, however, being part of a toxic research group will hinder your progress. If you are surrounded by people who deliberately bring you down, if you are stuck with a mentor who is leeching your hard work for personal gain, then you are better off seeking new collaborators. Finding scientists with similar interests, values, and compatible personalities requires time, but the internet has made that a lot easier than it was in the past. It is better to find one's tribe later on than be stuck somewhere you don't belong for years. Society will not stand still for you. It will evolve more and more rapidly as technology plays an increasing role at all levels of organization. If you are to succeed to the extent you secretly wish to, you must become creative in the face of the rapidly changing technology which will dominate your career. Changing oneself is not easy, as anyone who wanted to get in shape can testify. But that you can indeed change yourself is also evident from those who do succeed in dieting, quitting smoking, and exercising. We are in a very real sense, the sum total of our habits. And planning to change yourself, you should not try heroic reformations, which are almost certain to fail. Practice on small habits until you gradually build up your ability to change yourself in the larger things. Drop the wrong problem. Research is hard work in the sense of having to provide a great effort of concentration, not long hours of routine work. Yes, hard work is a prerequisite if you want to achieve good results, but if you work hard for a wrong cause, that will not amount to anything. Einstein was tremendously creative in his early years. But once he began, in midlife, the search for a unified theory, then he spent the rest of his life on it and had almost nothing to show for all the effort. If you cannot drop a wrong problem, then the first time you meet one, you may be stuck with it for the rest of your career, and that will eat up your mental health. Do not obsess over failures. Getting bad test results can ruin a scientist's week or even months of hard work. How well you recover from such setbacks is what will separate you from those who advance and those who give up. The conditions which lead to failure are never completely under our control. But the psychological reaction 
towards the outcome is entirely our responsibility. Instead of excessive rumination, do the activities that make you relaxed and joyful to overcome the setback as soon as possible. Theories are temporary misconceptions. I have often thought that the nature of science would be better understood if we called theories misconceptions from the outset, instead of only after we've discovered their successors. Thus, we could say that Einstein's misconception of gravity was an improvement on Newton's misconception, which was an improvement on Kepler's. The Neo-Darwinian misconception of evolution is an improvement on Darwin's misconception and his on Lamarck's. If people thought of it like that, perhaps no one would need to be reminded that science claims neither infallibility nor finality. There is no generic advice. The paths to good research are as varied as research itself, as varied as the researchers themselves. Individual researchers find their own paths according to whatever fits them. They may seek or be assisted by advice from others, but they must decide which advice fits them. The advisors too should target their advice at the specific individual seeking it. That is, try to fit this individual. Well, there is certainly a lot more that can be said about various aspects of research, but that is beyond the scope of a single video. If you like the content of this kind, please uh, comment down below, or if you want some other topics and issues about science and engineering covered, also comment down below. Uh, if you want to support this channel, please like and subscribe, and consider donating a few dollars on my PayPal if you found value in this content. I would also like to thank my friend uh, Zon from the channel Title Painting. He did the voiceover for this video. And lastly, uh, this video was mostly based on Richard Hemming's book, The Art of Science and Engineering. If you haven't read it uh, by now, I highly recommend you do so. Uh, thank you all for watching and uh, see you next time.